really special episode for me. I have known Dr. Kimberly Massey for 30 years, right? Like the early 90s, right? Yikes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we have find, found all kinds of excuses to cross paths uh, personally and professionally. And this is one of those opportunities where I can tap into your great depth of knowledge as a full professor at San Jose State University um, and you contributed an article to the book that I co-authored, The Conscious Communicator. We're going to get to that in just a second, but okay. welcome. Thank you Thank for being you. here. Such and an honor. Tell, tell, us, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm Kim Massey. I'm a professor at San Jose State, as Kim mentioned, and I'm, I'm Kim's professor. So that's really the biggest line on my resume. <laughs> um, I've been... Studying the media, thinking about the media, and teaching media and culture my entire adult life. Uh, I studied as an undergrad at UT Austin and got my degree in radio, television, film there. Went on to San Francisco State to get a master's in broadcast education communication. And then on for my uh, doctorate in communication at the University of Utah. So literally my entire adult life, I've been talking about the media. And you mentioned the media and culture. So yeah. what do you mean by that? What relationship are you are you talking about that is super fascinating that you've dedicated your whole career to? Well, everybody belongs to culture. And there's a million different kinds of culture, whether you're aware of it or not. There's the culture of a family and what being a father means and a mother or a sister or brother being a grandmother, being a nurse. So there's vocational cultures, there's fandom, like I am a big Sting fan. So there's a whole culture around Sting and being a San Francisco Giants fan or whatever. Uh, there's race culture, nationalist culture. Um, and any one of us, all of us are, so there's an amalgam of all these different cultures based upon where we grew up or how old we are or how we were raised or what our belief system is, which party we vote for, whatever it is. Maybe we don't vote. That's also a culture. So it's a culture of physical realities. For example, you know, um, like what we look like and uh what what where we live those sort of physical realities but it's also constructed realities uh and that is like like being a fan or believing in god or whatever it is right so the media more than anything else on you know in all of the cultures all around the world affects what those cultures are whenever new ones come on the scene and what they mean they define the they provide the definitions for what all of these cultures mean. And people will say, well, they don't do, they're not the most powerful influence, but they really are. The media we consume, especially as Americans, we consume media more than we do anything else. We consume media more than we sleep. We consume media more than we have dinner with our families, more time than we, the time we spend with our families. So because we consume and engage in media so much, it is statistically impossible, especially with all the messages coming through the media over and over again, repetitively, uh, the same messages over and over again, for us to not be affected by it. And the challenge is that everybody knows this, but nobody believes it. I've been talking about the same media effects and culture, defining what culture is, getting people to realize all the different cultures that they belong to, and how some of the cultural rules that they have to follow, they didn't even get to negotiate, especially in diversity, equity, and inclusion. They didn't even get to negotiate what it is to be black or to be seen as black by a white system or whatever it is, right? And even though I tell people you we're all affected by media, people are like, yeah, 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 but not me so much. I mean, I know I am. So therefore, how how affected can I be? And then I have to point out, you know, well, you're wearing a New York Giants or New York um, Yankees hat and those are Nike shoes and you're dressed like a student. What does that mean? 
uh, what's appropriate clothing for women to wear, what's not appropriate clothing, you know, all of this. And all of a sudden they begin to realize that they are um, products of their own cultural upbringings. There's a class that you and I have both taught and um, I know you're, you're kind of fading into the sunset as far as your career is concerned as a professor, but I, I, I'm teaching online now, but there's a class that both you and I have taught that is kind of a, it's a GE level, I believe. And mm -hmm. people, you know, students from all different kinds of um, majors will come in and take this media. It's, base, it's a basic media criticism class. Right. And a couple of the assignments um, that some of us who teach the sections uh, talk about, one is take, a, take note of all the products that you've consumed in a day to just write them all down and for what purpose and like what's the brand and then your analysis at the end of that is to say okay well first you're also supposed to figure out what your culture group is and some right. students don't have the introspection they actually don't know what the assignment is asking of them they've never been asked that question of what culture group they may go to race they may go to religion but their advertising and marketing people can you know, figure out a culture group in, in a second and they can predict everything of, around the products that, that a particular cultural group will gravitate towards, right? Because right. that's the science of it. And then the analysis is, did, are, do you see yourself being marketed to in these products? That is one assignment. The following assignment is taking, and I challenge and invite any audience member to do this for your own, you know, self uh, awareness <laughs> to take three days off from media, like take three days off. We call it a media diet and then see where your time goes when you're not scrolling on Instagram, for example, uh, when you're, you know, whatever it may be, uh, watching things on YouTube, et cetera. And what I find interesting is this relationship between those two assignments when the last question in the media diet assignment is around, are, will basically, will you return to your natural yeah. you know, consistency? Right. Far and away, they will. Far and away. Far and it's away, they very will. Interesting. They're not affected, right? So, so there's in those two assignments, we're trying to drill in critical thinking right. and, you know, around exposure and the normalization of media use and the definition of their own cultural group as defined and by media and advertising and stuff, and they still don't get it. Mm -mm. What's interesting is that when it first came out, when media, especially television, was first invented, there was a lot of concern about media effects because we had come out of World War II and because Hitler had done such an incredible job of PR, Right. He would stage these amazing epic events and then put them as the sort of before the movie shorts when you would go to the movie theater. And all of these sort of villages that were really remote would go to everybody who went to the movies on Saturday would, would see these epic events and were believing like, oh, well, the whole country field believes this. So it must be like a, a good thing, you know, um, with Yes, a whole underground of exceptions, but you you can see that why the concern existed is because if you can if you can win the minds of the public mind, then you could actually start a war or take over the world, right? I mean, and that's just an understatement of what has actually happened, really. Uh, but now, not so much. I mean, I think if you are feeding your children and they want to eat ice cream all day long, you say to them, well, yeah, we can have ice cream, but that's like a dessert and that's, that's, that's special. And really what we've got to do is we've got to eat our broccoli. You know, we got to eat some vegetables and some micronutrients and all that, and then we can have ice cream. But when it comes to media, people don't seem to understand that every minute that their kids are on online or on, they're consuming, they're consuming something. Right. And most of the messages are put together to sell, not just to sell you a product like lipstick or mascara or shampoo, but to sell you a meaning. Right. To sell you what it is to be a beautiful woman, for example, 
So, so many of my students, whenever they write down, you know, everything they use from the time they wake up to the time they step out the door, for women, a lot of it's makeup. And they have to write in, why do you use this? And, and their responses are very candid. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel good to look good. And well, who wouldn't feel good if they look good? But then I come back with the question of why is having longer eyelashes attractive? Who, who defined that? Why is having whiter teeth or straighter teeth or pink cheeks or any of the other makeup things like poreless? I mean, we are human beings. We have hair growing everywhere and we have, you know, eyelashes that get thinner when you get older and whatever it is. Um, why? Who who decided that? I didn't get to negotiate that. I didn't. Nobody ever sat me down whenever I was of age and said, OK, we're taking a vote. In your age group, you're 18 now, you can vote. What? How fat can women be and still be attracted? Nobody ever asked me. Mm -hmm. I was born into this. And this isn't being driven by people, people. This is being driven by people who are trying to sell products to make you believe that having short eyelashes is less attractive than if you had longer ones. And then you start using mascara. And then you the feedback is that people will go, oh, she's, you know, she's pretty attractive. And it brings you comfort, safety, satisfaction, and even pleasure from engaging in these activities. You know, um, I had a conversation with my daughter about monogamy, right? And her generation think about monogamy differently than my generation. Of course they do. I mean, every generation is different. And she said, well, I don't, I don't really understand, you know, why like monogamy after monogamy, because then, you know, if you get married or divorced and you remarry, you really, you're really just a serial monogamist <laughs> or like that. And I laughed and I said, because it brings me pleasure. It brings me pleasure to think about only being with one person. And why is that? Because that's the way I was raised. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I had been raised in a different culture mm -hmm. where I, I don't know, but I, that's what I always believed in. And so that's, you know, I like that. You know, I'm, you know, Tammy Wynette, stand by your man kind of, you know, and I fight it as a feminist. I'm like, I don't need it. And I, I don't. But whether I need it or not is irrelevant to my actions because it's what do I want? And what you want nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10, is based upon culture. And unfortunately, for the DEI portion of this conversation, the media and the images and the definitions and the representations have been dominated by money and by race. You know, so the same stories are getting told over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. Black stories that didn't involve blacks being maids and butlers and servants, the help mm -hmm. characters or, or sort of Characters that were clowns, you know, they're there for the entertainment of of uh, of white people. That didn't happen until the African-American community were seen as economically viable people to market to. Then all of a sudden you had sitcoms that were directed to the black community dealing with, you know, talking about black issues. Then you had uh Bill Cosby being a doctor and his wife a lawyer then and only then when when the market was deemed economically viable to be spoken to, then they got a chair at the table. Mm. Right. And there's a lot of conversation over the last few years and still to this day around digital blackface, for example, because the use of <clears throat> memes and GIFs and everything where it's this exploitation exploitation of black joy in a lot of ways, but used by white people um, to seem cooler, et cetera. And so look it up folks, you know, have the conversation, look at what you're sharing on social and the cultural culture that you're a part of uh, versus the culture that you're putting out there in a digital space. And what's your intention with that? And um, I can guarantee you that your intention is not matching the impact, especially depending on the audience. So, you contributed an article. Thank you right. mm -hmm. for the millionth time for mm -hmm. contributing this article to uh, our book. 
And the deeper dive topic is called the influence of stereotypes. Right. Can you read a little bit uh, the ending of your article there and then talk about what you were trying to convey to those who read the book? Yeah. Um, I'm going to start a little bit higher than the ending, just a tiny bit. In the end, it isn't enough to hold media producers accountable. It comes down to what we as individual audience members and groups do. The public needs to recognize that we have choices, but then we need to follow up by making good ones. If people choose to be passive consumers of media, not questioning the meaning or intent of media makers, all of society must live with the adverse consequences and some more than others. Conversely, if people recognize their power and agency by becoming an active audience member and or producer themselves, we can demand diverse content. We can strive for as many perspectives as possible, and we can question and develop our own interpretation of media content based upon our life experience, our education, family, and cultural influences. We can learn that the system doesn't work without us. If we back away from the relationship and demand DEI, especially joined with many others, media will be forced to address our concerns and needs. And finally, we need to be diligently, we need to diligently monitor our consumption behaviors, be skeptical, engage in critical thinking, slow down, check and separate facts from opinion, and check the origin or context or purpose of all information before we share it. Together and only together, we can socially construct a better reality by making it true every time we engage with media and with each other. Love it. Yeah, that's so the thing, you, you know. Go ahead. It's a, it is a, um, I, I mean, I, I always use the metaphor of a drug deal. It's a drug deal. You got a drug dealer with a product that's the drug and somebody buying it. And if there's no product, there's no exchange, right? And we are the product that is being bought and sold between media and advertisers. Media are getting us to the screens with content, whether it's a Netflix movie or you know, a network television show or a series or a YouTube video or a meme or an Instagram post, whatever it is. They, they drive us to the screens. They bring us to the screens and then they hand us over with all of our demographic information to advertisers who custom build now ads to appear on your social media or on your screens or whatever. So if we remove ourselves as the product, the drug deal can't occur, right? The exchange can't occur. So when we consume, we are present. And when we don't consume, we aren't. And if we demand better quality, they will deliver it. Because if not, their competitors will. And we'll go to those screens. And my students are always like, but we're so, we're just individuals. And these corporations are so big. And I'm like, McDonald's sells salad. McDonald's sells salad now. If you had bet me a billion dollars in my lifetime, because McDonald's was invented in my lifetime when I was a little girl, that McDonald's was ever going to sell a salad, I would have taken that bet and lost it because people were like, we got to start like eating also green things. We can't just be eating, you know, whatever. And all of a sudden McDonald's sells salad. So we do have the power. They, we just don't know it and they don't want us to know it. So the only thing I can think of to do is to educate people about their own power, their own cultural power, their own consumptive power. And the more active we are and the more demanding we are, the more we're going to get what we want. But if we don't ask and we don't demand, they're going to give us whatever they think we deserve. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. You mentioned in the article critical thinking and social construction. Mm -hmm. so, so social construction of reality is a media theory. Right. Can you speak to... It's my favorite one. What's that? 
It's my favorite media theory. It's my, it's my favorite too. Uh, <laughs> um, can you speak to how groups and populations have been stereotyped? You know, you, you've mentioned some examples, if you can add some more examples. And that narrative that's being pushed, that's being normalized, um, and how that relates to the theory of social, you know, basically, what, it, what is social construction of reality and how does it show up and what role does media, I mean, uh, critical thinking play as an antidote? That's a great question. I feel, um, well, social construction of reality is that reality is whatever we all agree it is. A good example or would be money, Right. I go into a store and I hand somebody a piece of paper that's really made out of cloth that has special ink on it that the Fed printed. And that piece of paper is supposed to represent 100 pennies, four quarters, 10 dimes, whatever. And I'm supposed to be able to hand it to somebody and say, give me that food or whatever, that candy bar. I'll take that candy bar. Although nothing costs a dollar anymore, but you get the point, <laughs> right. right? And that person has to take the money legally because it's legal tender. And we've all agreed that it, it used to represent gold in Fort Knox, but now I don't know what it represents because it depends on the market, right? But we all agree that it does. So it could be seashells. It could be sunflower seeds. Whatever we agree is worth money, is worth trade that and we all agree then that's what it's going to be and it's the same with cultural stuff and with defining of groups so if you have a stereotype let's say an asian stereotype women asian women are either completely virginal right or they're dragon ladies and they're heads of cartels uh they seem to be stereotyped to have all these sexual secrets you know and all of this stuff when, when you, and, and, you know, quiet and they don't argue and they keep their heads down, they bow a lot. These are all stereotypes, bad drivers, right? All of these are stereotypes. Does that mean that there aren't some people that are bad drivers? Yeah, but I've seen a, a lot of other bad drivers from all walks of life, old, young, any race. Drivers can be bad, right? So you get these stereotypes and they go out there and then you meet an Asian person person, and you're not Asian. Okay. You meet an Asian person. First of all, as a white privileged person, I would meet an Asian person. All kinds of cues coming at me before I ever open my mouth and introduce myself. I'm looking at this Asian person and I'm like, what kind of Asian person is this? Well, Asian people will tell you that they can, they can tell the difference between eight different kinds of Asians, but but Asians in the language are just sort of lumped under this category of Asian when there's all kinds of diversity going on, different languages, different locations, same locations, but different languages, customs, traditions, food, the whole shebang. But they're all lumped inside this one category. So I meet somebody new and my my son is a half Asian. My stepson is half Asian. And it was fascinating, but terrible at the same time to watch people engage him because they would say, where's your mother? And be really mean to him. And he'd point to me and I'm, I'm a white blonde woman. And he'd say, that's my mother. And then the whole story would change. The whole, the way they treated him, the way they thought about him. Oh, you're so wonderful, Kim. You must have adopted a Chinese child. And I'd say, I didn't adopt anybody. He's my stepson and he's Korean, right? So these messages that come to you through the media and these stories that are told over and over again and stereotypes that are given to you are sometimes, oftentimes, the only experience a lot of people have of other, right? So when they engage in with people that they don't have a lot of contact with, they already think that they understand who that person is. And, and they have zero idea because these stereotypes do not represent everyone in, in, in different categories. They just, they aren't. They're, they're shortcut storytelling plots. Because they only have 30 minutes to tell a story or an hour or an hour and a half, unless it's a miniseries. And then it's it's divided up into those amounts, right? Mm -hmm. 
So that's why the dumb woman is a busty blonde. And that's why the serious woman is a bookish brunette. And that's why, you know, who are the judges? Who are the criminals? Who, who's smart? Who's not? You know, older people are always sort of the golden girls, you know. People are always like older women are a little bit flighty and scattered. And I'm like, not B. Arthur. Like, and she wasn't. <laughs> she was like caustic and biting and had an incredible sense of humor and wit. But I guess they're more thinking about um, Betty White or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the stereotypes really make it terrible for, and those are just funny little examples little white privilege examples. I mean, stereotypes can mean the difference between people uh, having their partners in the room when they're hospitalized, making life decisions for them in the LGBTQ plus community, or being able to buy a house in a neighborhood if you're Jewish or if you're black or if you're Latino or whatever, right? If you're a person um, that is not white privileged. So, it's the, it isn't just, well, you shouldn't be watching that show because it's really not good. No, you shouldn't be watching that show because it perpetuates negative stereotypes that have real consequence for groups of people in really incredible ways. It can also be white men, can I say for the record? It can also be white men, which is, you know, the, uh, I get a lot of pushback from my in my classes from white men going, are we just going to be the villains forever? I said, well, you're not necessarily always the villains, but you are also affected. And shootings are the air, one of the best areas I can tell you, uh, especially school shootings. Um, if it were, if it were young girls or, or any person of color that's doing all the shootings, like if, if shooting after shooting after shooting was Asian young boys, this country would be asking what is going on with Asian young boys that they're going into these schools and shooting people, right? If it was women, think back to Thelma and Louise, right? How many sh movies have you seen where men are just shooting each other and killing each other and Godfather and cop shows and nobody seemed to care. But when two women did it in a movie that was super popular, oh my goodness, the media came out saying, you know, what is what is up with like, why is everybody watching this movie about these women shooting people? And I'm like, because we've been watching men shoot people since the cowboy and Indian movies. You know, from the start, what's the big deal if women were going in and shooting up schools, they would say, what is going on in America with these little girls? What kind of crisis are we in? But it isn't. Nobody's talking about the white young male crisis. And 99% of all these school sh shootings are done by white boys. We should be having that conversation. We should be, and I tell my white male students, identifying male students at that, I say, this would help you. A majority of crime that's committed in this country is again, is man on man crime. It's not man on women crime. It's man on man crime. You know, men are dying at the hands of other men. There is a crisis of masculinity in the country, but we don't talk about it because they're the majority and they're in, and they're in charge. So they're the more invisible under the critical lens, right? When you think um, minority, when you think minority, you think woman or person of color, right? You don't think white male because they're not a minority, right? So they're invisible to the lens because we're talking about these issues over here of the minorities. When you think gender, what do you think? LGBTQ plus or women? But what you don't think is white heterosexual male, right? Well, they have a gender. Mm -hmm. So why aren't we talking about that? Because white Almost uh, white heterosexual is not it is in charge, right? So the, that's invisible, and white uh, white as a race is is more invisible, 
right? Because it's, even though we talk about race, if we talk about race, critical race theory even, but race, uh, white, do, it doesn't seem to be under the lens, right? And so anytime there's a group that's invisible as the norm or the mainstream, or this is the way it should be, or everything's compared off of that, that's when you know who is the majority and who is in control because they're not under the critical lens. It's very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. When it, you alluded to one of the ways that I describe it to clients is there's the founding fathers of the United States, the characteristics of the founding fathers that, is, that has been normalized as the standard from which everything else is compared. Now, the farther away you are, when you get into intersectionality of identities, of marginalized identities, the farther away you are from the founding fathers' characteristics, the more vulnerable and at risk and marginalized you are because in correct, society yes. we have created this hierarchy of value based on these identities in comparison to what is considered, you know, the standard. Uh, the right. invisibility and is the very, very interesting. It is very interesting because I'm always asking that question when people bring up things to me and they're talking, you know, about whatever privilege or whatever. And I'm always saying, well, yeah, but we have to remember that we're all in this together, that white males also have gender and white males also have race and white males also, you know, whatever. Uh, somehow or another, I don't know how, but, you know, I think it goes in, in, and waves and troughs up and down, up and down. We have to convince people that it is in their best interest. It is in everyone's best interest to think about ramifications that affect all of us. I mean, global warming is a perfect example of that in the in the planetary realm, right? If you if you're wasting stuff and you're living a, a less than ideal recyclable life or whatever it's a tipping point everybody needs to to get in this together because we're all in it together but if the privileged whoever they are they could be white they could be whatever if the privileged would just realize that it behooves you and i thought the pandemic was going to do it i'm such a pollyanna Sometimes I thought this is going to be it when, when, when people realize that we all deserve health care, because if we all deserve health care, it's safer for all of us. Right. Mm -hmm. If everybody has access to testing and masks and whatever, you know, if you believe in it, um, uh, the shots, you know, whatever. What are they called? Vaccination. Yeah. Vaccinations. Whatever. If, if, if it's free, if everybody can get medical help and it's, and it's available because that should be a right. I mean, that should be a privilege, not a privilege. It should be a right. Everybody should have health care. It makes the whole, all of us healthier. And so that's healthier for me too, as a privileged person who will interact with people. I just thought the pandemic was going to do it. I don't, I mean, I think it moved the needle a little bit, but I'm just wondering if it's going to move back. It is to everyone's advantage. It's just trying to convince the people in charge and the people with the money and the people with the privilege that you are so rich that if you just gave up a little bit more in your taxes, it would make the whole situation. Your roads would also be better. Your, I mean, everything would be better and you're still going to be rich. You know what I mean? Uh, I have this this conversation a lot with with wealthy people. I'm like, where do you put your money? And like, what is your what is your? Well, I don't have to. And I said, no, I know you don't have to. I mean, nobody's requiring it in the law or anything. But where? Why wouldn't you? I don't know. You know, and and we are given these statistics all the time, like the richest five people or the richest two people or something could stop. Yeah. You know child hunger. And I'm like, wow, well, let's do that. And they would still be rich. <laughs> they have so much money. They can't spend it all. They at all. There's mm -hmm. no, they're not enough minutes in the day. So and I, we're not going to get into it, but I, I have seen some kind of futurists that are talking about with the, with AI and the capabilities of AI that there will be trillionaires out of it. So oh, I actually want totally. to have a part two with you, there's more that I'd like to ask you and have a conversation about as it relates to what we were just talking about. I think we pick up 
where we left off. There's more to be said around this, the power of communications, language, visual representation, as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I'll end this part, uh, this first part of the conversation with you on this question of what is to you and in your experience, what does communicating like you give a damn look like or feel like or experience? I think it's, it's, you have to not be afraid. You have to be not, you have to not be afraid to not be afraid. Um, and be ready. And I really do. I'm really proud of you. I have to say, even though I have nothing to do with this work that you're doing, but it's really, I'm very proud that a student of mine wrote a book like the fine art of not saying stupid shit. I <laughs> cannot tell you how thrilled I am. And I am doing the work myself. And it's that stopping and thinking before you open your mouth. And in your book, you provide the depth model, like so that to, to give, here's a way to think about it. And then it becomes second nature after you do it two or three times. Absolutely. And even still, I make mistakes. I probably have made a couple on this interview. But like in the, in the past, I may not have done this interview because it's so, you know, you, you can make a mistake. But I'm okay with making mistakes because I'm willing to apologize, learn whatever lesson I couldn't have known because I, of who I am and my position and being a privileged person and whatever, but now I do. And I will never make that mistake again. Right. And so I feel like it's just getting over this idea that everything has to be perfect. We are all imperfectly perfect mm -hmm. and understanding that everything we do, the way we live our lives, the way we talk to our children, the way we drive our cars, everything that we do affects other people. And if you keep that in mind and you're compassionate to yourself and say, I made a mistake, but I know I'm trying and I'm going to try to make up for that mistake and just keep moving forward. It makes it better for you. It makes it better for the world. And that's what we all have to do because one person doing it or a small group doing, if you just delegate your DEI sort of, well, there's a, there's a group out there that does that, right. you know, you or exactly. Or if, or if like black lives matter or LGBTQ plus, it's like, well, you know, they, they they're going to do that little, they're going to go out and they're going to protest about whatever. And like, they're doing that and I'll, I'll, you know, no, no, no. You have to participate and, 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 and engage and understand because Taking rights away from one group affects all of the groups, right? And has ramifications for, for everyone. And so I think that sort of thinking outside of yourself and not being afraid is, is sort of the key to the whole kingdom. That's just, that's been my experience. Um, because otherwise it's just, you know, it, it's, it's meaningless if other people don't, if only LGBTQ plus people, well, if in the black, in the black civil rights movement, if only black people had demanded rights and no white people had said, yeah, that's wrong. They, you know, that needs to happen. Uh, it, it, it may not have happened. It's when people, you know, stop being afraid and understand that no, it's not taking anything away from you. It is adding to all of us. And don't be afraid to, to have that opinion, express that opinion, and have difficult conversations about it. It's exhausting. As, as a gay woman, I would not have been able to legally marry without straight people, without heterosexual people, um, you know, uh, making it <laughs> legal, right? We couldn't have done it on our own. Yeah, let's vote. Things. You know, let's vote. Let's all of us get together yeah. and, and partner and vote, you know, mm -hmm. and... Uh, but I also believe, you know, uh, that cuts across all political areas. You know, I think that gun legislation should be had, but still, if people want to own guns, there, there's there got to be some kind of a legal way for that to happen or um, that's better for all of us instead of the way it is right now, which is no good for any of us. Anybody can be shot now, right? I mean, it doesn't matter. You know, mall in Texas, which just happened. And uh, 
And you're from Texas, and we'll talk yes, I about am. that in part two. Because <laughs> I, I think your your upbringing really informed uh, who you are today. Yes. And you saw some stuff. You met some people, and so, um, and then you know all the work that you've done, all the awards, the the, the published books that you've done, the papers, etc. Um, all of it is is coming from this 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 passion that you have for this work that I think we would all benefit learning more about and hearing more about. So we'll have a part two. That's How can people nice. find you, you and stay in touch with you? Um, I, you can always go to San Jose state university and, and my email is there. It's Kim with a B dot Massey at sgsu.edu. Uh, that's really the best way to get in touch with me. Excellent. Well, I look forward to continuing the conversation. I really appreciate your time. And thank you again for that contribution in the book. It was oh, hey, point. it was an honor to be asked, I, I have to say. And it's also an honor to have a conversation with you. I really do believe in the work that you're doing. And I think you are so smart. And uh, and I, I am really grateful um, that you have given me a, t a tool that I am now using to have very difficult conversations uh, about DEI in a variety of situations, not the very least of which is with other white people, white privileged people to say, we need to be talking about this. Even if we're not in the presence of a situation that's demanding it, we should be talking about it. And, and, uh, and it's given me a way to, to, to do that. And so I'm really grateful for it. Right on. Yeah. It's not enough to be not racist, right? We must be anti-racist. No, no, no. Racism is a white person's social construction of reality. Yep. So thank you. <laughs> so All right. Much, Kim. Okay. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. So what popped out to you from the conversation? The more conscious communicators in the world, the better the world. So go to communicate like you give a damn podcast.com and set up a one-on-one -on -one strategy session. And until next time, let's keep taking care of each other. <laughs>